to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, where you get to hear from the best minds in Bitcoin and crypto. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and this week I've got a very, very special interview. I've got Bitcoin OG and Blockstream CEO Adam back. But first, I do have a message from my sponsors. So let's talk about BlockFi. If you want to use your crypto without selling it, whether you're paying off student loans, buying a house or starting a business, BlockFi helps crypto investors use their Bitcoin, Ether and Litecoin without selling it. Backed by Mike Novogratz, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender in the US, servicing over 45 states with interest rates as low as 7.9%. And they have a special offer for the listeners of my podcast. If you sign up at blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you'll get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000. And applying takes less than two minutes. And next up, I want to talk to you about Make It Rain again. Mentioned these guys a couple of times now. If you need help with the marketing of your company or project, you won't do much better than working with these guys. They are the best in the business for SEO, paid, predictive, and social media. And I know because I've worked with them. They've also helped me out with the marketing of the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which they've done a stunning job for. They're based in LA, but servicing clients worldwide. And they also have a special offer for the listeners of my podcast. If you mention What Bitcoin Did when reaching out to them, they will provide you with a free SEO audit. So to find out more, head over to makeitrainusa.com. Okay, on to the interview with Adam so chuffed to get this i keep this spreadsheet at home with all the target people i'd like to interview adam's obviously way up there at the top and when they said he was in london could i see him of course i could of course i could so this was really cool and it's really cool actually because i've been reading a lot of the old bitcoin talk threads recently looking at some of the old email chains when people are discussing bitcoin and it's just so super interesting to see all these people you now see on twitter having these conversations back in the early days of bitcoin and if you don't know adam's background he was the inventor of hashcash a proof of work system used to prevent email spam which was also cited in the Bitcoin white paper, so his credentials speak for themselves. In the show, we talk about the history of Bitcoin, we reflect on the last 10 years, and Adam also gives me an update on the launch of Liquid. I really hope you enjoy this as much as I did. If you want to support the show, there's a section on my website which helps explain everything you can do. That's at www.whatbitcoindid.com. And also, if you want to email me, you've got any questions about the show, feel free to reach out to me at hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Good to see you again. Um, it's going to be very difficult for me to do an interview with you without asking quite a bit about the past. Um, I'm, I've been in this space probably a lot less than most people, especially yourself, a couple of years. And recently I've been digging in the past, reading old Bitcoin talk threads and looking at old emails that are sent between various people at various times during the history of Bitcoin. Some of my questions might feel a bit basic at times, but I've got so many things I want, do want to ask you. So... We're, we're a decade in. What are your overriding thoughts now as you've essentially been in the project since the start? Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, people on the cypherpunks list were interested in privacy technology, uh, things like Tor, uh, remailers for sort of email privacy. And there was, you know, of the applied cryptography things related to privacy that people were interested to achieve, the hardest and most kind of holy grail application was a deployed electronic cash system with some privacy and cash-like guarantees, like, you know, bearer, final, immediate final settlement, things like that. And so, you know, uh, that dates back to, what, 20 years now or something. And so... It's um, it's pretty exciting to people who were you know researching that, trying to figure out ways to make that work, and watching a couple of different systems try and fail for various reasons, like because they were centralized, or you know I think that was the primary failure in the past, um, and also at the interfaces. So Wei Dai in his B Money proposal, which was a 1998 proposal. Um, Said something interesting, which was he wanted to see an electronic cash system without an interface to banks, because the original, you know, one of the original systems by David Chaum, he made you know, a centralized electronic cash server with very good privacy properties, but the way he envisaged getting money into and out of it is you deposit money in a bank account, and it would issue you with coins, and you could deposit them for a credit in your bank account. And so his company went bankrupt, and the double spent database was you know, probably sold on equivalent eBay at the time or something and that was the end of that so um, I think 
that one of the you know most interesting things about Bitcoin, even though the privacy properties are worse, um, it is decentralized. Like so, it's a, it's a fabric that can survive any one company. It's very survivable. You know, individual companies can come and go, users can join and leave, and it will keep running as long as there's an incentive for miners to mine it, which is, you know, as long as there's a market value of any kind, that will be the case. It, you know, the hash rate might go up and down and new equipment will be bought. And different suppliers will be providing different services, but that survivability is, uh, you know, the miss it was always the missing agreement, agree, ingredient before. And do you think of Bitcoin now as still a, a project that can succeed or fail or do you think we're at the point now where it's beyond that kind of beta feeling where we're it's a success um i mean i think it's uh, there's 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 a phenomena called the lindy effect which basically means as the longer something has continued to be robust and survive the more confidence people have that that will continue to be the case and so it's definitely a lot further along on that curve and i think another side was hypothesizing in the past that there should be a point at which it has a bootstrap where even if hypothetically all major governments outright banned it, it would continue in the same way that kind of grey market goods uh, are continued to be supplied, particularly in the electronic domain, even if, you know, governments or let's say, you know, MP3 sharing, things like that, you know, it's not something that any particular government approves of typically, but it's very hard to stop. And so, I mean, for electronic currency like Bitcoin, the my hypothesized bootstrap was that everybody knows, you know, a friend of a friend who would be willing to OTC trade for paper cash. And, you know, there's uh, pretty robust markets for OTC electronic cash these days. And there are, there are like millions and millions of users and you do see you know, very interesting kind of evidence that this is the case, you know, that this kind of bootstrap has happened because um, some countries that have had a lot of Bitcoin interest, when on official terms they ban it, the local Bitcoins and other OTC platforms see a huge spike in uh, use. And basically that, that means it's time for the regulators to dial back their you know, controls because they have more visibility if they regularize it, then if they ban it, and it continues, you know, in a gray market where they have no control and less visibility. So do you think that in some ways that's Bitcoin's greatest achievement, that it has been able to survive despite whatever a government wants to do? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, it has a couple of different uses, but I think the sensor resistant uh, properties where you can... You know, there's there's no policy about who you can send to. Uh, there are not identities. I mean, there's some kind of pseudonymity. The privacy is not perfect. It's quite a lot of traceability, but ultimately, it's very difficult for somebody to prevent you sending money to somebody somewhere else. And it has no awareness or care about which location the recipient's in. And then you have the kind of bearer properties. So it's uh, you know, it's very hard to freeze, very hard to seize, uh, probably harder to seize than you know, some physical gold coins or a small gold bar in a safe or something because that's a physical item that could be found. With a Bitcoin, you'd never know ultimately if somebody was, you know, put a reasonable amount of care into it, it'd be difficult to, to find the Bitcoin short of, you know, like contempt of court like things where you suspect they have some uh, or you have some evidence they have some and you demand they turn it over. Okay, that's, that's the ultimate recourse. But for... For users, I think an interesting concept is um, uh, sort of uh, the true name concept. So there's a science fiction book, but I think it's Werner Vinge called True Names. And it's basically the concept that if somebody knows your name, they have some kind of power over you. Or if, if you're kind of obscure and knows who you are or you know that you have an involvement in Bitcoin or that you're involved in some online discussion group about politics or current events or what have you, then you're much more immune to interference. So um, Sounds very Jameson Mop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, the some people who have acquired Bitcoin 
have, have done so in different ways. So some people just, you know, why transfer money to an exchange and bought the Bitcoins? And that's, you know, most of, you know, basically at this point, all of the exchanges have KYC information, you have your, a scan of your passport and so on. So those Bitcoins are pretty much, you know, linked to you. But there are people who, you know, had more of a privacy thoughts in mind early on when they accumulated Bitcoin, or they did so before there were exchanges. So their Bitcoin were, you know, bought in a coffee shop at different times, you know, for a few hundred dollars in, in cash or something like that. And so those are much less linked. And so from sort of an asset protection and, you know, not standing out as an easily identifiable person who has Bitcoins, then they have uh, those bitcoins are in a way more valuable for that use case. Right. Okay. So whenever people ask me about Bitcoin, there's a handful of podcasts I point them in the direction of specific interviews, and there was one you did with Epicenter a while ago. I'm going to ask you a question they asked me, and that's a very simple question, but the answer was I found really interesting, and I kind of want a version of it on my podcast. So it's a very simple question, but what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? So. Huh. It's a lot of things, I guess, but um, I mean, it's a kind of virtual commodity. So I think the the kind of shortest version to somebody who's not, uh, you know, isn't isn't aware of it, and maybe isn't you know computer science kind of specialized uh, skill set is to say it's um, electronic gold, basically. You know, it's uh, and it's also a bearer electronic cash. Um, I think the gold-like aspect is just to say that it has scarcity. There are a maximum number that can be mined, and the cost of mining goes up over time um, as the scarcity increases. And that it's sensor-resistant and hard to seize and freeze. So I think those are the key and interesting things. And, you know, some people think about Bitcoin to say, you know, because there are different things you can use it for, different users have... Uh, different benefits in mind when they use it. So some people were thinking, oh, this is great. It's a uh, very cheap, uh, low value payments, lower fees. And other people were more focused on the um, sort of unseizability. And others were looking at it as an investment concept, right? The, the, those former two properties are very interesting. So they'd like to invest in the potential future value of that. And... So people with different use cases have uh, different ways they would, you know, want to see Bitcoin optimized. So I think that that caused some of the past debates about, you know, scalability and things like that. But I mean, ideally, you know, you would want, you know, Bitcoin has some pretty interesting properties that are interesting to many people. And you would want scalability for the primary reason that you would like anybody who wants to use those features to be able to and to be able to do so at a reasonable cost. But, um, and I think with scalability technology like Lightning, that's, you know, that's closer to, to reach. And um, Lightning is, you know, being actively worked on for a couple of years now and is getting much easier to use in, you know, more, more channels, more users and very fast adoption curve very uh, high energy, lots of people doing software development at the protocol level and the application and wallet and the integration level. So that's uh, well underway at this point. And it, I mean, it is a slightly different use case. So you would use like a, a wallet that supports Lightning. I would expect that most smartphone wallets will support both uh, within the next kind of six months to a year. Um, and actually, if you're using a smartphone wallet, it will probably be by default making and receiving lightning payments because you know it's a, a wallet i think on a smartphone you would typically not want to put more than you'd carry on cash in a, in a physical wallet and that that those are the kind of amounts that lightning can cope with very well and where the security trade-offs are reasonable okay so i'm gonna ask a few historical questions because it's really interesting for me and i think for other people who weren't around then okay firstly are you more excited now or than you were when you first discovered Bitcoin and the potential? Uh, actually, let's go with the f question first. When you first read the white paper, 
Did it feel different from all the other projects or was it just another attempt? Was this just another digital money and we'll see what happens? Um, I mean, I did think the decentralization was interesting and you could see a connection to like Weidai's B-Money and Xaba's BitGold concepts, which were kind of outlines, not like directly implementable. And so I think that was that was interesting. And so my, you know, I had two thoughts. One of them is that it's um, it's really not very private because the previous electronic cash systems were uh, providing extremely robust cryptographic privacy, but were only able to do that via a single server. So they had single point of failure. Um, another thought was the security of the finality. You know, is is unusual. So normally in cryptographic systems, let's say you're using PGP encryption. The cost to encrypt is a fraction of a second. The cost to decrypt without the keys is, you know, hundreds of years of supercomputers. So really an asymmetric security model. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's more like a um, uh, an evenly matched arms race between the people that want to see the system operate normally and some entities with mining equipment that want to disrupt it. And so, you know, the lack of a amplifier on the on the defensive side was kind of you know took some getting used to but i think ultimately um money works because people want it to work and bitcoin has benefited from you know even people who are you know on the attack side in terms of breaking protocols or hacking things finding bitcoin super interesting and so reporting the bugs rather than trying to exploit them in the very early days i mean at this point it's quite robust um so those were two thoughts. I mean, the third thought was, well, that's pretty interesting. Let's see if it bootstraps, because you bear in mind there was, you know, zero, zero market value, no marketplace, no transact. I mean, transactions, but just for fun, basically, mm. right? Like the pizza transaction and things like that, and just you know, people paying people for no reason, like no no exchange of goods, like here have have some coins to show that it works, kind of thing, yeah. right? So, you know, I thought, oh, that's that's pretty interesting. And that maybe, you know, well, we'll see if it bootstraps. And then maybe, you know, as that became evident, then I was thinking, well, my, my skill set, like for my, most of my career has been in applied cryptography, working on protocols, including electronic payment protocols with cryptography, that maybe I could use that uh, background to, you know, as, as the previous systems had very good privacy, but didn't bootstrap, here we have something with kind of weak privacy that is bootstrapped. Maybe we can incrementally improve on it. Um, I mean, it's much more challenging to to have those kind of privacy features in a distributed system, but there are different things you can do. So that's kind of where confidential transactions came from and some other ideas. Uh, those confidential transactions got implemented in the Elements open source project that Blockstream uh, worked on and in the Liquid network, which is a exchange settlement, mm -hmm. um, kind of a Bitcoin sidechain. I've got some questions on that coming up soon as well. Okay, so <clears throat> when was the tipping point in the early days when it went from being, okay, this is an interesting project to, okay, this is really exciting, we're really onto something here? Um, well, I mean, I think... I thought the concept was very exciting because you've got to bear in mind that, you know, I spent a lot of my free time for probably half a decade there in the like late 90s, early 2000s, uh, along with a number of other people trying to figure out different ways to make it work or puzzling over previous electronic cash systems to make them peer-to-peer -peer respendable or achieve other properties. You know, as you saw with uh, Weidai's B-Money and Nick Sabo's Bitcoin, that the idea that you could use hash cash and proof of work to mine a coin and try to make that decentralized was something that occurred to people within a year of being familiarized with the proof of work concept. Um, that, you know, that concept was there, but there were technical hurdles for technical, economic, incentive, game theory hurdles that people didn't manage to overcome that uh, Bitcoin finally did. So, you know, so definitely like the idea that this is uh, 
at, at a very inter interesting intersection of crypto technology and uh, societal kind of impact, which is which is something that I find interesting in general, like PGP and Tor and things that shift the balance of power and the internet itself, you know, publishing and so on. Um, so, I mean, I certainly hoped it would bootstrap, but, you know, it wasn't clear if it would. And um, there was a previous electronic cash system by David Chaum. He uh, moved to the Netherlands, operated a company called DigiCash, and there was a demo electronic cash server that he set up. And, he, you know, they, the company made the assurance that they keep the demo running and it would never issue more than a million coins. And you could ask for coins just by emailing. They'd send you some, like a faucet. And so I had some of those coins. And a few, you know, some of the people on the cypherpunks and crypto lists, it occurred to them to try and, you know, seize the opportunity to bootstrap this currency. So they did. Like, they sold T-shirts and, like, you know, low to medium value items uh, using it. And they figured a few thousand people, because it only had a million units, would you know, maybe achieve a stable value. And because they called the tokens beta bucks, like dollars, um, people had a hint that, well, maybe it should be worth a dollar. So they would typically use that as an exchange rate. And so that that was in progress. And I'd sold a couple of things on it as, as, as well as, you know, probably a few hundred other people. Um, and then DigiCash went bankrupt, and that, that was the end of the double spend database. And so your coins were not provable. That like electronic cash system is, you if I give you a coin, you have to rush and deposit it to the bank. Otherwise, I could spend it somewhere else, and you wouldn't know. Right. Um, so that that feature was lost. So uh, that that was you know informative. Um, and so you know the idea that Bitcoin might bootstrap was connected in my mind with that event. But, you know, still it was an unknown, right? So I think when it got maybe up to a dollar, which took quite a while, you know, for there to be exchanges from the price to be a dollar, that kind of felt like, okay, well, that sounds more like reaching the same kind of stage as the DigiCash uh, kind of unsanctioned experiment by a bunch of guys on the mailing list. <laughs> and then when we hit $20,000, how did you feel? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I... That was like a pretty good price. And personally, I'm expecting you know, that Bitcoin has enough utility and potential value that we'll see that and more in the future. I mean, it, it's ha always had a lot of like kind of deep volatility cycles. Um, uh, so I mean, I, 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 I see the, you know, the, the market price mostly being driven by um, the future potential and investors who are trying to invest in that future potential or interested in the digital gold, you know, asset protection and seizable characteristics as a kind of um, counter cyclical or insurance against geopolitical instability, basically. And gold has some of that too. So, you know, Bitcoin has some advantages to gold too. You know, that you can send it at a distance at very low cost. You can verify that. It's you can equivalent of SA it, right? So you know that it's a real Bitcoin. You know, even a smartphone wallet will refer to servers that tell you that, and you can tell you can verify it for yourself at pretty low cost. With gold, you know, you have gold ETF inflation, physical gold has sometimes been, you know, mixed or forged or what have you. Um, and so you could you could see Bitcoin becoming a competitor to gold. And, you know, if you look at the private ownership of gold, which there are various estimates for, that would already imply a quite optimistic price for Bitcoin, per Bitcoin. Um, you know, I mean, there are only, as, as people say, you know, it's when you think about it, there are only going to be 21 million coins and there are you know, billions of people in the world, some, you know, reasonable percentage of who might find it interesting to own a little bit of Bitcoin. Yeah. There are certainly some countries where there is a kind of tradition of having private ownership of gold as a form of investment or savings or, um, you know, whether where the local currency is fairly high inflation or something just as a way to hold on to value. Right. So Bitcoin can, uh, I think, potentially compete in that area. Um, and people talk about, you know, the 
volatility. Um, but I think longer term that will decrease and presumably at some point it will get to the top of the adoption S curve, like you know, internet use and cell phone use where basically everybody who is interested in the use case has heard about it and has, has adopted. And at that point, you know, you should be, it should be in a more stable uh, state. Now, of course, gold is still relatively volatile, but you know, you could get you. I could see it getting to something like that, and that would be more of a stable value. Well, so I listened to an interview with Murad this week on um, Pomp's show, and he said we need a volatile Bitcoin to become a global uh, digital asset. Um, the only way it can do that is to be volatile, to, to increase in price quite quickly. So I, I don't find the volatility something I worry too much about. Do, do you find, so back to the other question I was asking, so do you find it more exciting now um, that it's Bitcoin has a global infrastructure, it has institutional interest, it has various different responses from governments. There's like, it's a whole new set of problems to negotiate do you find this more interesting now than back when you when you originally discovered it and you're looking whether it can bootstrap? But how do you compare the two? Well, I mean, it's uh, definitely bootstrapped in, in several regards. I mean, also in that kind of it would continue even if somebody tried to shut it down. But also a number of governments, I mean, some governments have kind of officially discouraged use or allowed use, but discouraged exchanges and, you know, different trade-offs. But for the most part, um, it seems to have been accepted and, you know, regulations have, have been created to accommodate it in a lot of countries. Um, but, I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's interesting to look at the differentiated use cases. So the use cases that only Bitcoin can do. Um, because, you know, if you look at those, those are the areas where existing systems can't compete with it. And so I think those are the censorship resistance, permissionlessness, right? You can just install a smartphone app and somebody can give you some money. There's no like registration, sign up, approval kind of process. And then, you know, sense resistant payment and uh, bearer ownership are, are things that basically banks and other forms of payment can't compete. And there's a use case for that in the world. I mean, there's a use case for physical cash in the world. And it's, you know, most societies acknowledge that there's a need for physical cash for, you know, a trade-off between privacy and, you know, um, state controls or things like that. So Bitcoin provides that in the uh, internet domain. So I think it's, you know, the use case is here to stay and there's not really any scenario where that can go away. Um, but I do think it's those, you know, unique differentiating things, which are the most interesting thing to me in, in the beginning in the, and, and still now where some people may have a more kind of, um, you know, investment use or looking, looking with interest when a kind of more, you know, whether, whether a sovereign wealth fund would buy Bitcoin or something. So, I mean, uh, of course, it's, you know, it's fine and interesting if they do, but I don't think that's a differentiating use case, right? I mean, yeah. that's, that's more like the gold investment by, you know, um, the central bank of a country as a gold reserve or something. I mean, the interesting use case is the end user uh, sort of self-sovereignty that that they can achieve by having some Bitcoin. So um, now, of course, you know, companies invest in all kinds of things, right? Companies and countries invest in all kinds of things, including startups that are, you know, making self-publishing software or encryption software. So it's certainly to be expected that <clears throat> different investment vehicles would invest. All right, okay. Last kind of historical question. During the ten, last 10 years, has your thought process, has there been any significant changes in your opinion or thought process with relation, with relation to Bitcoin? I mean, it's, um, I think it's still, you know, you can understand Bitcoin at different levels, but I think that even the people who are 
you know, implementing details of the protocol or, um, you know, thinking about cryptography protocols or incentives and game theory are effectively still learning things, which might be surprising to some people. But I think, for example, the uh, fork uh, issues that happened last year with the, you know, the UASF um, so apparently yesterday was the anniversary of the cancellation of uh, the 2x, right. Bitcoin 2x fork. Um, so I think the way the game theory played out there was instructive to everybody on with all viewpoints. And the fact that Bitcoin you know, completely shrugged off basically a large segment of the business and mining community and said, no, this is what the users want. And the economic incentives basically forced that to happen was uh, very positive for kind of confidence in the kind of long-term store of value potential and immutability, which I think is pretty key. You know, you can't have kind of like a business lobby or some special interest coming along and saying, well, this is a nice internet protocol you have here, but we want to, you know, modify it to optimize for this use case. And actually, um, there's a quite interesting analog with uh, internet protocol um, governance going back to I think the early 90s where with, within the IETF there was a period you know that was largely kind of universities and academics and practical developers working on protocols and as internet companies became you know, companies building browsers and different appliances became larger and more influential some of them started to think that they should have control of the internet protocols. And so they tried to bring about a governance change in the internet, in the, in the ITF um, system, so that you know, companies would get a formal vote and they would be able to basically you know, um, coordinate between a few companies to, to haggle over what they were gonna vote on and, and change internet protocols. And it was kind of similar to the UASF situation that ultimately the you know the people who were historically working on internet protocols were able to reject that and i think that was a very good thing because you know a very sort of commercialized control would be a much less valuable internet it would be you know more restrictive and optimized for commercial interests so it would trend back towards a kind of walled garden centralized control thing. And I think a lot of value actually comes from it being an open network with protocols that are basically, you know, open and for the user's interests. So I think that there was a, a mirror in Bitcoin going through that phase to say, no, actually we want an open protocol process where basically there's a, a consensus decision-making process where there's technical consensus, which means that the um, technical community agrees that an improvement is, you know, has no significant and valid technical defects or better alternatives. And then also consensus among the users and investors and so on. Um, and it was, there was also very interesting, kind of some people were convinced and, and proven completely wrong about the... Uh, influence of miners in the situation. You know, they they literally thought that miners decided on the protocol by the blocks they produce. But you know, some people saw it, some people didn't. But anyway, the the forcefulness with which that was proven and the the short time period with which that you know that view folded and collapsed was uh, instructive and interesting. And and basically, it's kind of like the so BIP one four eight proved to that point. Um, yeah, I think so, you know, and the sort of game theory that led to the cancellation of 2x, which I think was that, you know, they realized that the miners support was only philosophical because basically, you know, if a miner is mining gold and, you know, they happen to have a big plot of copper to be mined over there and some business guys saying it would be better for us if we mined copper instead, and the miner said, yeah, that would be good for us. We have a copper mine. And then um, we support that philosophically, but then they realize that the market price for copper is like 1% of the market price for Bitcoin. They're not going to mine that for very long or they'll be bankrupt, right? Presuming the cost of mining it is the same. So 
um, you know, I think the miners basically conveyed like, you know, we can't, we can't mine unprofitable things for more than like half a day or something. So, you know, it's, it's not going to work mm. unless the market agrees. And it's kind of the same thing for companies, right? If they're selling something different that people don't want to buy, um, you know, but basically it was a kind of uh, market influence story and the, uh, um, and the other subtle thing is that the users who are running full nodes and the businesses and many of the smartphone wallets kind of cross check against a full node these days, um, their software decides what's Bitcoin to them. And so if a miner mines something which is incompatible with that, they don't even see it, right? It, it doesn't show up in their software. It doesn't look like they got paid. And so, you know, essentially the miners have to uh, follow those rules where some people had the misconception that they decided those rules and the rest of the world would automatically follow. And that's, you know, just um, technically not the way it works in, mm. fact, in practice. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So uh, another journey I've been on is going uh, through the history of the scaling debate and just seeing at the different points, the different views people had from, from the very, very early days. But during that, I found a quote from Barry Silbert where he said, the... So there were essentially three parties, miners, companies, and devs. And he said, when we tried to come to an agreement and the devs weren't part of the conversation, it was very easy to come to a, an agreement between the companies and the miners. And I thought, well, of course, <laughs> because it's entirely financially motivated, whereas the devs seem to come much from a long-term uh, user perspective, philosophical perspective. Yeah. So I just kind of found it a very strange statement. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was, you know, no doubt done with good intent in the sense that as well as having a commercial interest, they were interested to see adoption, which, you know, basically everybody is too, but at what cost, right? So, you know, if you... And what if, time, and not time frame. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, on a practical basis. I mean, th there is some, there's another interesting aspect of that, which is, you know, the three groups you mentioned, the businesses, the miners, and the developers, is that... There's another very important and ignored group, which is the users and their economic yeah. views. And that's basically what won the day. And actually, you know, the developers had, I mean, the developers are very conscious going back many years ago that they don't want control and they don't even want the appearance of control because that's risky. You know, bear in mind in the early days, it was unclear if Bitcoin would be banned in, in major countries, for example, right? And... So, and in fact, the UASF and Bit148 was not supported by most of the developers. So that was really more grassroots, you know, some sort of small group of like a couple of developers. Uh, one of them pseudonymous, in fact, which is kind of interesting, uh, Shailen Fry, um, implemented that. And, you know, a couple of people, a couple of technical developers supported it vocally, but largely it was kind of user, user groups, uh, a number of small and medium-sized businesses and Bitcoin embassies and Bitcoin meetups and so on that were um, most vocal about it. And I think the other thing that helped is you got a preview of what the market view would be. Because, you know, if people just say, well, you know, I mean, some of the businesses would say, well, we have a million users and uh, we represent them. <laughs> and... Uh, that's hard to evaluate in practice, right? They don't actually know that if they continued on that path, if they would have zero users the day afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, uh, the you know, Bitfinex put out a, a future, which then allowed you to see a market price. And the market price was very low compared to the business and minor support. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the minor support, which it turned out was philosophical and not economically able to, you know, follow through on that, was kind of inverted. I mean, the price was under 10%, and I think the minor support, the philosophical support was in the 90% at one point. But nevertheless, the economic viewpoint of the market sort of pretty much immediately inf prevailed with pretty convincing finality. Um, so a lot of good uh, things to learn from that. I mean... You know, and I think, you know, a number of the people involved in the 2X were, you know, kind of on the fence or, you know, were a bit hesitant about the whole thing. They just wanted to see some kind of 
progress on scaling and uh, maybe didn't you know weren't quite as connected with the technical consensus process that comes from the ietf history so you know i think it's um there were there were reasonable debates to happen about it right mm -hmm. um i mean i do think that this kind of 128 megabyte block size stuff is nonsense you know, it doesn't that doesn't make sense in a kind a new of scaling war Oh yeah, but I mean, I don't know if I barely pay attention to that. But but I mean, I, I mean, some some interesting things may come out of it because they seem to be. You know, now, you're, now you're talking about the Bitcoin Cash yeah. having another fork within itself into two or three forks. Um, e Cash Cash. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's uh, what is it? It's uh, SB. Uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, kind of. They need a better name than ABC, but yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. So, so those two groups. I mean, you know, it will maybe be instructive to see how that plays out because some of the players in that seem to be going at it with a different uh, perspective, like at least claiming and posturing that this time the the miners are going to be uh, more aggressive and like burn money basically for a period of time. And so, I mean, the whole thing is within a small percentage of the overall hash rate because the hash rate of the whole thing is like, what, five, six, seven percent or something of Bitcoin's hash rate. So, you know, you're talking about sort of two or three percent pitted against two or three percent, but there seem to be a couple of big players who might have the pockets to kind of uh, have a hash rate fight yeah. But I th it'll be interesting because I, I suspect that even so, you know, it will come down to economic views of the users. Next up, I talk to Adam more about Bitcoin and the launch of Liquid. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsor, BlockFi. Need to make a payment but don't want to sell off your crypto? BlockFi can help. BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender in the US, servicing over 45 states. Use your crypto to do things like buy a car, pay off your credit card or even pay your taxes. There's no need to buy tokens or pay a membership fee to get started. You can visit blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did to learn more about using your crypto without selling. They have a special offer for the listeners of my podcast. If you sign up at blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000 and applying takes less than two minutes. Well, I thought one of the things I thought was most interesting out of that, which I saw yesterday, was uh, Roger Veers tipping his hat to Core about contentious forks because he's essentially experiencing one himself now. Yeah. And I think he's probably reflecting on that, thinking, "Okay, I get it now." I yeah. thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's good. It's good to, you know, I think it's uh, positive for people to acknowledge that they were wrong about something. And I mean, in a technical domain, people are very happy to do that generally, right? You know, they have a, a technical view that their protocol version is better and they argue forcefully and then somebody points something out and they go, oh, uh-huh, yes, you're right. Okay, forget what I was saying, that was rubbish. Like, mm -hmm. so there, there's no kind of pride in, like, my proposal is really striving to find the best solution. And if somebody has a better solution, you're excited to adopt it, right? So... You know, it's, it's harder for people to do that in politics. And I think a lot of people participated in the scaling discussion as if it was uh, politics or something, right? Which is uh, for not, not a good direction because that's where the fiat currency is. It's controlled by politicians and, you know, banks that are influenceable in a pinch by central banks that are subject to moral hazard, ultimately. You know, the Genesis book quote about moral hazard from Mervyn mm -hmm. King and so on. Um, so, yeah, but uh, I think, you know, some people learn from the previous fork and some people are learning from the new fork. Mm -hmm. But people learn by different ways. Some people learn by, by analytics. Some people learn by doing and seeing, say. It's kind of one hell of a, an immune system that Bitcoin's built up this last... 10 years, I was discussing it with somebody else and said, I was comp saying it's anti-fragility, it's its immune system, you know, going through the civil wars, the Mount Gox collapse, um, Silk Road collapse, you know, there's so many things like China banning, so many things 
it's kind of incredible that it has survived. What, mm-hmm. Why do you think it, it continues to survive because of that? Well, I mean, like I said, I think... Lindy uh, effect. Well, Lindy, but, but I mean, I think the anti-fragility is, is basically, you know, the people with an interest to see it, to use it and benefit from it and see it as socially valuable. So they will do things like argue for UASF and adopt, you know, install 148 and make economic statements in the market, like short the future or, you know, sell one coin and buy another. And so I think the the economic forces are very important and the technical anti-fragility is also, you know, if there are technical defects found, people will fix them. So it's kind of like aircraft crash investigation, right? It becomes more robust over time because any issues of a technical nature are you know, fully and thoroughly investigated and robust fixes put in place and deployed. That's my favorite. One of my favorite shows. Do you, do you oh, I watch those. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> so that actually got me over my fear of flying. <clears throat> I just have a real bad fear of flying and I've watched so many of those. It's like... They've kind of they've kind of fixed everything. And my dad was an aircraft engineer, and he said that the final problem to fix is relying on pilots because the <laughs> majority of problems come down to them. Yep. Wow. So look, we've covered a, obviously we would cover a lot, and I, there's probably a hundred more questions on the history I'd love to ask you. But I do also want to ask you about Liquid because yeah, that's the project at the moment. Um, some people are not going to understand what a side chain is. So can you give the briefest explanation of what a side chain is? Yeah. So it's um, kind of an auxiliary chain. So you've got the main Bitcoin chain, which I think is the most sort of robust and secure, uh, partly because of the economics of the situation, the network effects, and the amount of uh, yeah infrastructure, like you know ways to buy and sell and connections to merchants and things like that. Um, and so there's an interest to you know build additional layers. So one layer is Lightning, which is on top of Bitcoin but preserves most of the bearer properties of Bitcoin. Security model's a little bit different, but ultimately you have automated recourse to the Bitcoin chain. And so um, sidechains are another layering technique. So it's a way to make another blockchain that is connected in some technical way to Bitcoin and be able to move Bitcoins into the sidechain and use them in there and bring them back out again. And so a key part of that is that there is some um, kind of firewall between Bitcoin and the sidechain. So if the sidechain were to have a technical issue, it wouldn't affect Bitcoin. It would only put at risk people who'd opted into the sidechain. So it becomes a vehicle where people can try new things. And that's exactly what we did, right? So we, with the Liquid sidechain, uh, we implemented confidential transactions and confidential assets, which are pretty interesting cryptographic things that have some quite good um, cryptographic uh, security assurances and basically make similar security assumptions as the digital signatures used in Bitcoin already. Um, so they're much less technical risk than, you know, snarks and other things that people have contemplated in some altcoins. Um, but nevertheless, it's, you know, it's a new thing and it has different trade-offs. Those transactions are bigger. Um, and a sidechain is also... You know, the, the kind of sidechain we built is a federated sidechain, so it's not being mined, rather it, its blocks are being signed by uh, two-thirds or over two-thirds of, uh, particip- of members, and the members are um, exchanges, basically exchanges and institutional traders and things like that, who anyway have the infrastructure to host in a secure data center uh, like their hot wallet and their cold wallet and things like that. So we give them another box with a hardware module in it that is a block signer. And so there's a, there's a peer-to-peer network between them which users can join and receive and validate blocks, kind of similarly to the way you do it in Bitcoin. But the blocks are actually, you know, the, the analog for miners is this fixed set of signers. Uh-huh. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is that miners can join and leave dynamically. And actually, you don't even know who they are. They're kind of anonymous, right? And that's a, that's a feature. So with the sidechain, there's a different trade-off, which is you know, it provides less assurances in some ways um, because it's a fixed set of signers. Yeah. Um, I mean, that could be changed you know, with software or with users agreeing to 
port the state of the chain into another set of signers. So it's slightly more centralized. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, the use cases for... But is uh, it almost like, sorry, so if it was, uh, feels like almost like you're describing the settlement layer into uh, exchange, so they can trade with each other quicker, faster, but then yeah. they can settle back to the main chain? Uh, yeah, so you can take uh, sort of these pegged Bitcoins, which are called uh, LBTC. Yeah. Um, you can take them back to the main Bitcoin chain, and if you're going to cold store them, you'll be advised to do that because it'll be more secure. Um, but you know what Liquid is providing is an alternative to leaving coins on in the custody of a single exchange. So what you can do is withdraw Liquid Bitcoins and other Liquid assets from an exchange into a you know a hardware wallet or a smartphone wallet. And now you're not vulnerable to the you know, custody failure of a single exchange, you're, but you're still trusting the sort of uh, this automated peg that is secured by the hardware modules and all these servers. But you know, if if you were to consider the scenario where all of those businesses decided to steal your money, um, it would take two thirds of them, so 11 out of 15 at the moment, in order to take the Bitcoins that are held in the automated peg. And so, you know, that's, you, you can certainly, there's certainly, you know, a spotty history where, you know, further in the past, more than recently, um, individual exchanges have failed or, you know, lost custody of funds or suspected that the Exchange operators might have even taken them and pretended to be hacked or something. So that you're, you're, is when you have funds out of the exchange but in in liquid format, you're less exposed to that because an individual exchange could do its worst and they wouldn't be able to take the funds. Now, so the idea is basically because because the network's faster, um, it's more plausible to keep your funds off an exchange and deposit them when you want to trade, and to be able to take arbitrage spreads, you want to be able to move money quite quickly. So one of the bottlenecks today is that, you know, more on the fiat side, it takes days sometimes to get money into an exchange. And by the time it gets there, maybe the spread is gone. So it's kind of like frustratingly slow. You can see the trade kind of drying up while you're waiting for your transfers. At the same time though, then therefore this could probably kill off a lot of the arbitrage opportunities. Well, it's a trade-off. So um, you get, get deeper liquidity. So basically you get more volume right. and the spreads become lower, but the overall volume grows. And the, so there, there are reasons why this is uh, beneficial to driving uh, trade volume in general, other than the arbitrage, which is you get, you get more liquid and deeper markets. So sometimes people try to do a transfer or, you know, transfer Bitcoin and then sell it and take a local wire transfer. And sometimes they fail because today, because liquidity is too small in some countries for like a medium sized business transfer or something. So you, you know, you get more use because those liquidity problems get fixed and, you know, lack of liquidity has been a, you know, one of the factors, uh, the regulators have used against approving ETFs so far. So it's another kind of input into having a deeper, more liquid market. Um, and the other thing is kind of user trust, right? So if users are able to trade with lower trust, they will be more inclined to trade. So um, other than having coins in your own custody and depositing to trade them, there's a possibility to do a kind of um, atomic trade. So two users can have assets in their wallets, which are you know kind of managed by the automated peg um, but they can place a, an order while keeping their own custody, place the order on the exchange. So they can use the exchange's order book and matching, but they haven't deposited their coins. They've sent like a partially signed transaction to trade. So let's say, you know, I want to sell a Bitcoin for $6,500. I sign a half of the transaction to swap one Bitcoin for $6,500 and you do the other half because you want to buy a Bitcoin. And then you know, that can get matched in the exchange order book. So all the exchange has is these kind of partially signed orders. 
So the worst that could happen is somebody could be forced to pay 6,500 for a Bitcoin, and they can do that without hacking the exchange. They can just right. go on the market and do that. So it presents a lot less sort of risk. So, so ultimately, you should be able to uh, transact without exposing yourself to individual exchange custody. And so that's a kind of incremental step forward for right. today. So are, are LBTC collateralized by real yeah. main chain Bitcoins? Yeah, so, so what happens is there's an automated peg. So as a user who wants some LBTC, uh, you would probably go to an exchange and deposit Bitcoin and they would do it for you and let you right. withdraw LBTC. And that's uh, The Rock, which is one of the early uh, people to implement this and make it available directly to users. That's how they do it. So you can deposit liquid Bitcoin or main chain Bitcoin and you can withdraw main chain Bitcoin or liquid Bitcoin and they manage a pool of liquid Bitcoin to do that. So they're kind of swapping it for you. But you can't create liquid Bitcoin without real Bitcoin. Right, yeah. So the the uh, the the full nodes verify that. So, okay. it, you know, the, the functionaries verify it, but you as an individual user, if you're running a full node, you, sh you run a liquid full node and you also run a Bitcoin full node and it will complain if you don't have a Bitcoin full node running to check against. Um, you know, if, if it sees a transaction coming on the network from somebody claiming to peg in, it will check that actually those funds exist on Bitcoin where they claim to be and that the Bitcoin node agrees that those are, you know, real valid funds verified by the Bitcoin node and that the peg in transaction is valid before it will recognize it and show it to you as a liquid Bitcoin on your node. So okay. if you're, you know, running a full node on liquid is, you know, uh, it will be a little bit more expensive than Bitcoin because these transactions are bigger and they have lots of crypto in them. So kind of like dozens of signatures per coin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's within reach of uh, a power user to do it. You can right. run it on a desktop with, or a fast laptop with, a, you know, consumer internet connection and keep up. Um, so it has that kind of a degree of self-reliance that you can see uh, that what's happening is what's claimed to happen. Now, of course, you are trusting that the exchanges operating the full, uh, the functionaries, we call them, these the kind of hardware servers, um, don't gang up and two thirds of them take the Bitcoins out of underneath. I mean, you know, if that were to happen, you would see it, but there wouldn't be much you could do about it apart from, you know, legally complain that they stole your money or something, right? There's no... The game theory isn't there to do it, though, right? I mean, well, right. So the the operators of the network have, I mean, they're not miners, so they don't get a mining reward, but they economically benefit from the increased volume of faster trades. And so they have an incentive to see the continued operation of the system. Um, so it's a different kind of incentive, but there's an incentive to you know not interfere with its operation, basically. Okay. Like a weird comparison, you'll probably hate it, but it does, there are some, sounds a little bit similar in some ways to EOS in terms of. Um, I mean, I think one key difference. Way, I don't like EOS, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about it, but I think one key difference is that it's a automated peg with hardware modules, whereas as far as I understand it with EOS, there's a lot of, uh, you know, discretionary behavior and phone calls where things are decided and stuff like right. that. So there's no... You know, there's no mechanism for anything like that okay, yeah. in Liquid. So it's, you know, it's a peg, but it's automated and it's enforced by hardware modules. So, you know, I think, but but the people who, it's for traders, right? So the people who are trading on exchanges, uh, the exchanges know who they are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not like, you know, permissionless, censorship resistant assurance anywhere near what Bitcoin would be. So... The people who are looking at the use case of benefiting from Bitcoin sensor resistance and bearer status and things like that, they should use a Bitcoin chain. Like Liquid is a, a different trade off. It's another kind of layer two. And it's an incremental improvement over giving a single exchange sole custody of your funds. That's it. Okay. Right. So, you know, if you if the alternative was you deposit money on exchange and you're worried the exchange will you know, make a technical failure and lose all the funds, okay, Liquid will help you because you can take them off the exchange until you're ready to trade 
knowing that you can deposit them within a minute or two. Right, okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, is it trustless? No. <laughs> <laughs> so... Apologies. But, no, no, there was a healthy discussion on that topic over the last few days. So, uh, the... I mean, the, the point is that... I had to ask. No, that's fine, yeah. So, uh, the, the point is that the... Um, you can validate what's going on. So I think before we released, so, you know, Liquid has been running since late September, but we're playing catch up releasing software to support different features. And there are more things to come as well, right? So we released the Block Explorer mm -hmm. that can inspect Liquid Network transactions and Bitcoin transactions. So it's a Bitcoin Explorer too. Um, and we also released the full node so that people can run a full node and you know have a higher assurance that this information is correct than looking at the block explorer which you know we're running so you have to trust us that that information reflects what's actually happening in the network so you can inspect it and i think before we did that people you know when, when every time you release a new technology that's kind of complicated has different trade-offs people try to wrap their heads around like okay what does it do what is, what what is the security model who can use it and I think people had an assumption that it was, you know, exchanges only could transact or hold assets in it, or that it was a private network and you wouldn't be able to look at it. And that was, you know, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the case, but, you know, putting four nodes into people's hands and themselves as power users, being able to, you know, create an asset on it and get some liquid Bitcoin and transact with it peer to peer, kind of, oh, that made the point for them, right? Oh, okay, this is... Um, you know, you can transact with this more directly than we realized. That's cool. Um, but, you know, the trust, the trust model is, is what it is, right? It's a trade-off and it's an incremental improvement on single exchange custody. But the assets in it are, particularly the liquid Bitcoin, are IOUs to that automated peg. And if that automated peg were to fail in some way, you'd have an IOU, you wouldn't have Bitcoin. So it's not as bearer. So I think the the uh, kind of indirection is you you have kind of close to closer to trustless control of an IOU, but what good is, <laughs> you know, control of an IOU if the person who has the actual assets won't give them to you, yeah. right? So that's that's the distinction. Now you can you can argue, I mean, and that's that's typically inherently the case for many types of assets. So Bitcoin's a special asset class, which is directly bearer. Mm -hmm. Liquid Bitcoin's not as bearer. You know, there's a there's a automated peg that you have an IOU to. Um, but other other assets that you see in blockchains like fiat coins, US dollar coins, Teller and Gemini US dollars and others, um, have some inherent custody risk, which is, you know, does the company that has the funds in a partner bank's account like dip into the funds or does the bank, you know, seize the funds or something. So you have that kind of risk. Um, and that's, that's a palpable risk because it's uh, still pretty hard for, in some places for exchanges to maintain stable banking relationships. So it's typically not that they had the funds frozen, but the bank decided to stop offering service to them and then they have to go find another bank and transfer the money. So there's that kind of risk and uh, sort of custody risk. And another one is people have used you know, color coins and tokens and all different terms for it, but basically the equivalent of uh, some kind of shared interest in an enterprise. So whether that's a profit share or a share ownership um, or some kind of token, there is trust that, you know, the money that goes into it, will the company even build a product or keep the money? That's definitely happened in a lot of cases. Um, if they do build a successful product, will they share the profits with you or will they keep them? And, you know, even completely aside from blockchains, for example, with a Kickstarter that went into the Oculus Rift, the people who kind of funded that company got some alpha hardware and the founders of the company sold it for billions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, know, you have to pay attention to what you're buying. So if you're buying a piece of alpha hardware or a kind of vanity token that shows I was there, I uh, donated to build the early stages of this project, doesn't mean that they'll benefit. And, and typically, the investment contracts on a lot of uh, historic 
sort of blockchain tokens that were claimed to be investments have very defective investment contracts. They're kind of anti-investment contracts that say it's a donation if you read the fine print. Well, that's uh, interesting. So I interviewed Brendan Ike and obviously researched uh, the BAT token mm-hmm. as a donation. I don't think anybody who bought the BAT token thought they were making the donation. So I've, I've been through that as well. You yeah. Can, you can create, you can issue token. well, you can issue assets on... On liquid. On yeah. liquid. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, actually you can, some users have, you know, uh, got themselves a small amount of liquid Bitcoin, which is the fee currency yeah. on liquid. And... Um, to create an asset is just a special kind of transaction. So the fee for creating an asset is nominal, you know, mm-hmm. 10 cents, 20 cents or something, right? Um, so you can you can do that and then you have a key as the asset issuer, which allows you to, you, know, you have control of the issue, you have ownership of the initial issued assets and then you can transfer them to people. And there's an optional feature where you um, you can make it like a one-shot issuance. So you, there's a defined number of coins and that's it. You don't have the ability to make any more. And there's an option where you have a second key, which is a reissuance key, which allows you to issue more. And, you know, in a conventional stock company stock scenario, people do that. Like mm. They take another investment round and they issue some more stock, which dilutes the existing stockholder. So there are reasons that you might want to do that so you so you could create securities on like, yeah i mean you could well you can you can create assets yeah. now can you create a shit coin on i mean shit it's <laughs> it doesn't have mining but you can certainly create coins with arbitrary yeah. uh you know claims about what you're going to do with a coin or what yeah. it's used for what software you're going to build or what company it represents but you know the the ability to create a test token is a separable question as to whether one of the exchanges would list it. Mm. And, you know, there are, there are some people who are working on uh, security tokens. So basically working with existing uh, stock exchanges to um, issue tokens that represent regulated securities mm-hmm. and... So I think in those, they would take steps to ensure that the customer is like in some way approved to buy a security in this country. Accredited, yeah. Yeah, it's like an accredited investor or I guess a customer of a, you know, a online brokerage or something like that. I mean, not everybody may be familiar, but a lot of um, existing financial products are restricted to given countries because they're different rules. So it's quite common in Europe that you'll see, if you read the fine print of a structured product, it'll say not for sale in the US or something Mm -hmm. and vice versa. And that's because the tax rules are different. The ownership rules are different. There are different restrictions. Um, And so for regulated securities, they have that you have those kind of uh, questions. So I think they're typically done in partnership with um, a stock exchange or something. Right, okay. Just a couple more questions on that. We've uh, we've rattled, well, we haven't rattled through many of my questions, but we've covered a lot. Um, so you can do private transactions within uh, liquid, liquid or elements, is it both? Is it both, is it yeah, actually you can um, uh, compile the elements codes and put the right configuration into its configuration file and use okay. it on liquid. So it's compatible, so it's kind of open source. And uh, liquid itself is, you know, the, the full node is open source as well. Right. So so the difference is basically uh, default configurations to auto connect to liquid network with the right parameters. Okay. Um, so my first question is, if you can offer private transactions on liquid, are you potentially going to be facing questions from regulators around KYC and AML? Is that something that you, you're thinking about or worried about? Um. So actually, when we first introduced confidential transactions, we were we had a thesis that uh, blockchains that are fully transparent, like Bitcoin, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of um, financial institution interest in 
understanding blockchains and using them for different applications, that that the complete transparency would be a problem for adoption. So like they would see the, you know, our thesis was they would see this and think that's very interesting and we could drive value from it, but it's so transparent and public that we're scared to use it because we would divulge, you know, our trading positions, how much we're paying our suppliers, when we're doing a deal. And, you know, so some public markets have, you know, a public ticker or a delayed publication, but other markets are not like that, right? And so we thought, okay, this is probably a necessary ingredient, confidential transactions, to see widespread practical adoption. And when we did release it, I actually saw that that was how they took it. You know, they took it positively that that was a needed thing that uh, they could have basically commercial confidentiality and still derive the value of a publicly auditable blockchain. Um, so there's that. And I mean, in the liquid domain, it's, you know, the users are uh, customers of exchanges, basically, right? So while, um, you know, to, to take Bitcoins out of liquid, you basically need to do it with the exchange. And there's a security reason for this, which is that the pegouts go to a cold wallet controlled by the exchanges. So each exchange has a cold wallet and the hardware module enforces that the peg out goes to those cold wallets. So it's just an additional security mechanism. So the only way to peg out is to do it for an exchange. An exchange, you know, has users. So all the exchanges have, you know, they know who their customers are. Right. Uh, so I mean, some of the um, participants are institutional traders. So their customers themselves as well. Right. And where do you personally stand on privacy with the main Bitcoin chain, and do you think we have a potential another civil war coming with regard to that? I mean, I'm you know that's that was my uh, first reaction to Bitcoin is like the privacy needs to be improved and fungibility as well, which is a related concept. So yeah, I mean, I would uh, personally be very interested to see confidential transactions and things like that make their way into Bitcoin as they you know as people get more confidence about them and as the technical trade-offs are better understood and the assurances, you know, maybe the efficiency improves, like the size, they, they're a little bit big, like a couple of kilobytes, so they're maybe about 10 times bigger mm. than a regular transaction. But to me, you know, if you could if you could pay one cent for a clear text transaction or 10 cents for a confidential transaction, I'll take that confidential transaction. And I mean, also there are... Um, a confidential transaction is a more powerful transaction. So it's quite common that people will break Bitcoin transactions up into uh, multiple transactions, basically in search of privacy, uh, particularly like value privacy. So if they're doing cold storage and they have 10 Bitcoins, they'll kind of like make 10 one Bitcoin stashes. <laughs> and then if they want to like dip into it to buy something, they will know that, okay, the person can see this transaction, but it's coming from one Bitcoin, not from... 10, right? And so, you know, that means that for some uses, there are actually lots of transactions. So if if a confidential transaction can do that same guarantee, but with a single transaction, then it kind of displaces multiple transactions. So the fact that it's bigger is not as painful as that, as you, you know, you might assume at, at first. So, I mean, I think it's pretty interesting to see what people think about that, you know, because Bitcoin generally only accepts opt-in changes that you know, nobody has a clearly articulable reason why it would be a bad thing, kind of thing, or something like that. So, and I mean, one of the interesting things is the the breakdown of views may be uh, different along different lines, like orthogonal to you know the the arguments about scaling. So, I think scaling, to my point of view, is uh, well achieved by Lightning Layer Two because that has much more scalability. I would, I would say on-chain scaling has very bad scalability because the, the overhead grows beyond linearly. It grows like N squared. So that's, that's a bad yeah. protocol to be uh, scaling because you, know, you, push, you push things up by 100 times and now you have 10,000 times the overhead and that at some point becomes untenable. So 
Lightning kind of solves that. But um, for fungibility and privacy, um, you know, it, it's I, I uh, participated in a um, Reddit a discussion thread a few years ago, and I posed a question actually that Trace Mayer had put about you know what what do people consider like users and investors? What do they consider to be the key differentiating properties of Bitcoin? Like if Bitcoin lost this property, if they would be much less interested. And it seemed like there was almost universal agreement on privacy and fungibility being key uh, amongst users and investors. I mean, okay, it's just a small group of them because that's the Reddit community. But, you know, the Bitcoin Reddit is like a million users these days almost or something. So, um, but there may be people that... Uh, would have concerns about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe they think it might decrease a little bit the chances of certain types of investor buying it or certain regulations or financial products built on top of it being approved. Uh, but I would argue that a more fungible private Bitcoin is more valuable to its core use case. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Okay. Conscious of time, final question. So we've had 10 years. Where do you see Bitcoin going over the next 10 years? What would you like to see? And what do you think is going to be important for it? And what, what do you think we might be talking about if we've sat down in another 10 years' time? Um, so I'd like to see more fungibility and privacy uh, you know, make its way into Bitcoin. And in each release, there are a you know, major release of uh, Bitcoin reference and the protocol, uh, BIPs. There are usually a few kind of incremental privacy improvements like... Uh, down to line is one thing that's happening at the moment and Schnorr signatures have some advantages and you know the taproot and graft root stuff has some advantages so there's a kind of continuous incremental but I'd like to see some bolder things too like the confidential transactions or things with effects in that uh, area um, and so in terms of uh you know, the evolution of that, I mean, I assume we'll get, 10 years is quite a long time, maybe we'll get closer to the top of the S-curve and see some more stability and wider adoption and, um, you know, wider groups of people using Bitcoin for different reasons. It, it has a lot of interesting properties that people can use it for quite diverse reasons. Um, and... I think, you know, much more usability. Certainly ETF products don't provide the same guarantee as but as a as a way to get investment exposure, they're a lot simpler for many people. So I had kind of uh friends ask, Okay, how can I how can I buy it? <laughs> and uh call in their broker and every every year or so and asking like, Can I is there any way I can buy it? And I think you know within some countries there are a few like exchange traded note products and things like that but um you would assume that those kind of financial wrapper products would start to be available so that it becomes easier and i think the other direction you see is some of the online brokerages have added uh, bitcoin as a asset that you can buy through their platforms so that's, that's another direction and you know the retail um the retail offerings are uh, becoming wider as well like uh Square, for example, with their cash app, you can buy Bitcoin. And I hear their um, Bitcoin sales are growing quickly. I mean, they're a public company, so mm -hmm. their kind of quarterly uh, statistics are published. Wow. Okay, this has been everything I thought it would be. Very easy. Uh, great conversation. So many things I didn't get into, but that's fine. Um, you can uh, just finish off by telling people how to keep an eye on what's happening at Blockstream with Liquid in yourself and who you want to hear from, if you want to hear from anyone. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, to keep up with what we're doing, there's a blog on the blockstream.com site where we uh, post updates. And there are a lot of things in the pipeline other than the Explorer and Liquid full node. So we'll be uh, putting out a... A version of the green dress wallet with liquid support which will make it a lot easier to manage liquid assets and uh, 
also working with Trezor and Ledger on hardware wallet support. So that will kind of improve the security and provide another option for handling uh, liquid funds. Um, and, you know, for people who are interested to try things out, there are, you know, there's an IRC channel. The uh, Bitcoin core community Slack has a elements channel where people are talking about elements of liquid and, you know, try it out and read the guides. There are some kind of power user how-to guides on elementsproject.org, which is the kind of open source site for elements. Um, and, you know, if you're an exchange or trader or, you know, um, OTC kind of proprietary trader, um, certainly get in contact with Blockstream. We'll be interested to connect you with uh, an existing exchange or potentially join as a, as a member as the network grows. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on, Adam. Thank you. Amazing. Okay, so what did you make of that? Did you enjoy that as much as I did? God, that was great. I could have spoke to Adam for hours. I love talking to him about the old stuff. I've been researching some of it myself, reading old Bitcoin talk threads, reading old email chains, just seeing what was going on in the early days is so super interesting. I could have, honestly, I could have spent hours with the guy. Totally fascinating. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Look, if you want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Firstly, you can think about becoming a patron. So head over to patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. There's some options there. I think I've got over 30 now, which is very, very cool. You can think about becoming a show sponsor. If you're interested in that, feel free to email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com and we can organize a time to have a chat about that. Downloads are growing super fast. Probably going to do over 100,000 this month. So yeah, feel free to get in touch if you want to sponsor the show. You can leave me a review on iTunes. Also click the subscribe button. Both of them help with my ratings in iTunes. Hopefully a five-star review if you think it deserves it. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Medium. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm at What Bitcoin Did on everything. And if you reach out to me, I will most likely reply. You can check out my website. That's www.whatbitcoindid.com. Loads of useful resources on there. Different ways to navigate the podcast. And you can also sign up to my email newsletter on there, which was meant to be a daily, but I've got so super busy. I can't do it every day. But somebody has volunteered to help me, which is really cool. So hopefully that will be coming back very soon. And lastly, you can share the show out with your friends and family. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who supported the show in any way you have. Coming up to a year anniversary, I can't believe it. Coming up to my fifth year show, it's crazy really, but thank you so much for all the support. It's been a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun, and I just appreciate everyone who helps in any way you do. Okay, I'll let you go. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon.